Uh-oh. One second, y'all. got to turn y'all around. There y'all. Hi, everyone. My name is Kai McDonald, and I am the GA at the OMA, I think. Uh, are there people here? I don't know how to use live. One second. Let me see. Should I wait for people to get in here? I don't know what's going on. Let's see. Um, okay, let me just chill right here. Um, okay. Hey, Ren. <laughs> okay, let me wait for some other folks to join or at least two more people hmm. okay I think I'm going to just wait Okay, I think I'm just going to go ahead and start. People can join in when they join in. Okay, so, um, hey, Belong. So, um, I'll be reading Black Girl in Love with Herself by Trey Anthony. And this book is a guide to self-love, healing, and creating the life you truly deserve. And then I'm going to start with the introduction because I believe the introduction sets the tone for the book. And the introduction starts... Um, with um let me see five months before the first draft of black girl in love with herself was due to the publisher i found myself broken a hot mess and i barely recognized my life how did i get here this couldn't possibly be my picture perfect life this couldn't be the good life that i had spent the last four years carefully curating and creating and of course posting all over social media <laughs> The life that people commented on as if I were living the fairy tale. The life that people hashtag couple goals. My partner and I were the power couple, and I was an acclaimed award winning writer who would turn her immigrant racks to riches story into a TV show. I was the first black woman in Canada to have her own TV show. They called me the Oprah of Canada. And I now motivated thousands of women to take action on topics such as love relationships and living their best damn lives i loved my life and my work and i truly thought i was doing god's work we often talked about our plans to leave a legacy and with her brains and my creativity and our strong work oh excuse me y'all my strong work ethics we knew we could change the world i thought we were unstoppable in our spare time we jet set it across the world it was not unusual to catch us jumping on a plane to Dubai, England, Barbados, or Hawaii. We ate at five-star restaurants around the world, taking pictures of our fabulous meals. We hired a car service to take us to the spa for the day. I often came home to five dozens of roses on the counter, and of course, I would Instagram that shit immediately. We often sent long, lovey-dovey public Facebook messages to each other just to ensure that the world knew that we were in love. We were that black couple. <clears throat> we were that black couple who made it. We gave hope to all black women that one day they too could be living the fairy tale. I felt blessed that someone successful, rich, and gorgeous had, had chosen me, and I would pinch myself at night thinking, how is this possible? My relationship gave me a sense of identity and purpose. And if I'm being honest, it also gave me a sense of importance. I was raised by a single mother who had me at age 17, and I spent most of my childhood being shuffled from one home to another. I grew up working class in public housing and got kicked out of the house at age 19. Yet somehow, I seemed to have achieved the impossible, and I was eager to share my secrets with the world. Here I was, the black girl, the black girl love expert who was going to tell how I had attracted the love of my life. I had done the work, inner and outer. I had spent the money on therapy. I had written the list where I told the universe or God what I wanted in a partner, and I was not going to settle for less. 
I read that list every day until it was practically burned into my brain. I had prayed that Sierra prayer, watched every episode of Super Soul Sunday, and by doing all of this, I had attracted my big love. I was living the example of never giving up hope, and love could find you too, girl. I knew so much about about love that the biggest self-help publisher in North America gave me a damn book deal to write about it. Now suddenly, here I, here I was in the fetal position, sleep-deprived, crumpled on the bathroom floor, crying hysterically and gasping for air. What the hell happened to my life? Nothing made sense anymore. My fiancé of four years had just abruptly ended our relationship via text. Yes, girl, text. I was in disbelief. We were supposed to be getting married in Hawaii, and four weeks prior, we had moved into a brand new luxury condo. Boxes were still unpacked, and we had recently hired a fancy interior decorator to create our beautiful home. I had even I even had a date circled in my calendar to, dis, to discuss paint colors for the nursery. Nursery? Oh, yes. I read that text while trying to wipe baby poop out of my shoulder-length locks. I had a brand new adopted baby boy who was just 12 days old, and now I found myself with less than 10 days to vacate the apartment. The walls of my perfect life were crumbling. I was numb. The baby picking up on my obvious stress began screaming uncontrollably. I could not find the energy to go to him. What the hell did I miss? How could I not know my relationship was in jeopardy? How could I have continued to offer thousands of women relationship advice and miss the tsunami hitting my own life? My inner critic, who I dubbed Critical Kathy, quickly showed up to kick me while I was down. And girl, she wasn't playing as her voice took over my head. Trey, you're an awful human being and an awful mother. Everyone is going to laugh at you. Full carry moment minus the blood. This is all your fault. Why did you think someone like you could live a fairy tale life? And now you've been dumped. You obviously don't have a clue what it takes to be in a relationship because if you did, your fiance would still be here with you making a bottle of formula. And if that weren't enough, now you and your baby are going to be homeless. My life was in shambles. And the irony the irony wasn't lost on wasn't lost on me that I had supposed to turn I was supposed to turn into a book telling black women how to live their best lives. You're a fraud, critical Kathy kept telling me over and over. How did I get here? I didn't have a damn clue, but I knew in order to figure this out, I had to dig deep to find the courage to accept that in this moment, this very moment was indeed my life, my sad, pathetic life. That I could not change. As painful as this moment was, this is where I was. So on the bathroom floor, I made a silent plea to the universe. Please show me the way. I don't want to die. I don't want to live like this either. I begged the universe to show me the lesson in this. I broke down, weeping, <clears throat> my wails matching my babies, and suddenly the baby stopped crying, and it was it was <clears throat> as if my entire world had stopped spinning. I heard a whisper, a soft voice from within that said, "Tell the truth, tell the ugly truth, tell all of it. Your your mess will be your message, and if it and it will free others to live their truth. A calmness came over me. I knew the universe wasn't done with me yet. I had experienced a lesson that wasn't just for me alone, a divine assignment that I needed to share with others, a lesson on what to do with your life when it doesn't match up to the curated, curated version that you have displayed on Instagram, <clears throat> on, what you, on what to do when you are not chosen, what to do when you when you forgot how to love yourself because you weren't you were counting on someone else to love you what to do when you didn't even know how to love yourself in the first place finally i needed to share with black women how to get back up from being a crumpled mess on the bathroom floor because sometimes girl you've got to get up and write a new chapter a chapter that you were not expecting because you thought you had finished the damn book slowly and painfully i rose from the bathroom floor it was 4.50 a.m. and the baby was due for his 5 a.m. bottle. I had to pull it together. I took a long, hard look in the mirror and saw a black girl staring back at me with tears streaming down her face and snot running from her nose. I looked at her and I said, Hey, Trey, we are going to love you a little bit better. Starting today, starting right now, you are going to be a black girl in love with herself. 
that was a good introduction. And so I will now go on into the first chapter and it's titled Dear Mama. And um, also in the book, there are um, little playlists and in the beginning of the chapters, you know, you can download this stuff. I guess this is what Trey wanted us to listen to, uh, to remind us of these chapters. Um, so again, chapter one is called Dear Mama and the black girl playlist for it is Dear Mama by Tupac Shakur. My constant antics to impress my Jamaican West Indian mother are often met with a raised eyebrow, a look of confusion, in her expression in her expressing the desire that I should have gone to med school or law school instead of prancing around on the stage. My mother has no clue how it ended up being a popular relationship or lifestyle coach, but often from the stage I will see her in the front row trying to conceal a bashful, proud smile as she politely claps along with the packed audience filled with brown and black faces. She is the first to jump to her feet at every one of my talks as if she looks around to ensure that everyone is giving me a standing ovation. Yet, she still can't hide her astonishment that I can feel I can fill a huge theater and that women pay to hear me speak. And no matter how many times I try to explain to her that I'm a professional motivational speaker, she does not understand why corporations and organizations pay me lots of money to deliver keynotes about self-care, self-love, and putting yourself first. Trey, you're a wellness expert? What is all this nonsense? My mother tries her best not to giggle because everyone knows that I am the sensitive one of the family. But I know she finds my profession quite comical and somewhat absurd. After all, she's a woman who worked three jobs in order to provide for her three children. In her world, there was no time for meditation, journaling, yoga, or going to workshops to find your inner child or holding hands and singing. To her, these things that white people, these are things that white people do, not us. Black women have no time for such nonsense. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to stop and go through the comments. This book is called Black Girl in Love with Herself by Trey Anthony, and this is the cover. Okay, Um, so I was shocked when a few days after my bathroom breakdown, my mother came to see me having driven from Tampa to Atlanta. Before her arrival, she never voiced her concern to me, but I could tell by the frequency of her FaceTime calls that she was worried. And I knew she must be extremely worried to show up unexpectedly at my front door with my baby sister. Instead of asking how I was, she did what she did best. She headed to the kitchen to make all my favorite dishes, stewed peas and rice with pigtail and beef and curried chicken and white rice. She heaped them on large plates and silently watched me eat. She rearranged my kitchen, cleaned my entire home and, uh, I'm sorry, dutifully uh, bathed, bathed, fed and cradled and watched her new grandson while she shooed me away, telling me to get some sleep. I must have looked like a wreck if my mother was encouraging me to sleep. My Jamaican mother viewed sleeping and laziness as the same thing. When I was growing up, my mother's favorite thing to do was burst through our bedroom door at 7 a.m. yelling, Okay, children, there must be something more constructive you could be doing with your time. My mother would wake us up for no apparent reason other than she was up, so everyone in the household needed to be up too. And now, here she was encouraging me to sleep. This had never happened in my lifetime. My mother watched my slumped shoulders and water-filled eyes with caution. And through my closed bedroom door, I heard her and my sister whispering about my mental well-being. They were concerned. My mother assured my sister that I was a fighter and I and that I would get through this. After all, so, so many women in my family had been let down by love and life before and got back up. That <clears throat> That's what, oh, sorry, y'all. That's what all the women did in my family. We made it through. We didn't crumble. We didn't grieve. We just got up and kept going. No matter how much pain we were in, we didn't show it. I knew that this was expected of me, so I forced myself to put on a brave face for my family, biting down hard on my quivering lip every time I felt tears were going to fall. And my mother wouldn't know what to do with an outpouring of my emotions. The women in my family were not emotional. We were brave. 
strong and proactive. We were not women who fell apart because someone had hurt us or let us down. I tried to recall a time where I had seen my mother cry, but I couldn't. She didn't even cry at her own mother's funeral. My mother is one of the bravest women I know. She is my superhero. My mother spent most of my childhood in full out survival mode. She was born in Jamaica and came to England when she was 12 years old. At age 17, she had me and a few years later, my brother was born and several years later in her 30s, she had my sister. In her early 20s, she decided that she wanted, to, she wanted more and took the bold step of packing up her shit and moving to Canada, which beckoned as the land of opportunity. I was eight years old when my mother left me and my brother with our grandmother to move to Canada. We were separated from our mother for four years, but eventually she was able to send for us. She had managed somehow to find an apartment in a working class neighborhood and took pride in the fact that she had a shiny brand new silver Hyundai, which we piled into when she picked us up from the airport. My earliest, my earliest memories of her constant of her constant of a tired looking woman who was always rushing out of the door, heading to her numerous jobs to provide for her family. As she left, she would rattle off a list of what she needed to be done in her absence. As the oldest, I was second in command and she expected her 12 year old daughter to step up. Laundry needed to be taken to the laundromat. The chicken needed to be taken out the freezer. I needed to get the oven sprayed and clean the stove, give my brother dinner, help with his homework, wash the dishes, season the chicken and make our school lunches for the next day. My mother was the queen of multitasking and her favorite saying was learn to whistle and ride. Basically, she didn't think it was impossible to clean the stove while having a load of laundry in the dryer and quickly making bologna sandwiches at the same time. Each minute needs to be used efficiently. There was no time for sleep and definitely no time for rest. Shit needed to get done. We knew that if we were not busy, we needed to act busy because my mother would find us something to do. And my mother had no time for wallowing in self-pity. Productivity was key in our household. And even if you were tired, worn out, hurt, scared, or overwhelmed, you just got back up and did what needed to be done. There was a big expectation placed on me to ensure that things got done. So it was no surprise that this large and in charge 12 year old who was her mother's right hand girl grew up to be an overachieving adult. I became the first black woman in Canada to have a show, The Kink in My Hair, on a primetime TV network. It was a half hour comedy based on my successful play of the same name. This little girl from the hood was now a big deal, but I felt like at any time someone was waiting to snatch away all my success. That someone was monitoring me and waiting for me to mess up so they could take everything from me. I was suffering from a major case of imposter syndrome. Cheryl Sandberg in her book, Lean In, talks about this. She writes that every time she succeeded at something, she believed she had fooled everyone yet again and that one day soon the jig would be up. I think women of color, especially black women, face another loaded layer version of this. Michelle Obama often talks about how women, how women of color feel they have no right to be, be at the success table even after they've achieved success. Oh, let me go back and read that. Even after they have achieved success. Because the higher we go up the ladder of success, the fewer and fewer faces we see that look like us. So we start to think perhaps it was a mistake or a fluke that we actually made it. Often, you may feel like you are indeed an imposter in your own life and that someone is going to discover that you shouldn't be here. I was experiencing extreme imposter syndrome and had the anxiety of being found out. And I was keeping... Um, let me go back, y'all. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I read super fast. So I just like when I'm reading, sometimes I'll skip over the words and I'll get to the end. And I realize that did not make any sense. But going back, <clears throat> I was experiencing extreme imposter syndrome and the anxiety of being found out was keeping was keeping me up at night. I wanted to prove that the world that I I wanted to prove to the world that I was the horse that you bet on. I prided myself on being a member of Team No Sleep and boasting that I only needed a mere four hours of, of oh, thank you, <laughs> and boasting that I only needed a mere four hours of rest per night to get through the day. 
I worked long hours and put ridiculous demands on my schedule. I love long to-do lists and set up daily personal challenges to complete them. I wake up at 3 a.m., be on set at 4 a.m., and spend 12 hours per day reading, writing scripts, and then acting in the show. After I wrap filming, I'd invite myself into the editing suite to give my unsolicited advice on edits and cuts for the show. Micromanaging and ensuring that every that everything was getting done the way I thought it should. Then I'd hear over. Then I'd head over to the new wellness center I had just opened to give a talk or class, or do some more micromanaging to make sure that everything was running smoothly over there. Finally, I'd head home and deal with the medical care and needs of my terminally ill grandmother, who lived with me while she battled stage four cancer. After spending, after spending time with Granny and making sure she was okay, I go to my home office and brainstorm some more ideas for the show, watch the edits, and memorize my lines. Some nights I was so exhausted, I'd, I'd, I fell asleep at my desk. Other times I'd, I'd get to go to bed just a few minutes before midnight and toss and turn for three hours before jumping out of bed to do it all over again. I was running on empty and I ignored the telltale signs that all was not well with my body, such as my lack of sleep and occasional chest pain. And then one day, shit hit the fan. I was in the editing suite when a, when a sharp pain gripped my chest. I ignored it. Then it struck again. My body was in pain and my left side felt numb. What did I do? Instead of telling one that I was in pain, I asked for some tea. But then the pain became so unbearable that I actually keeled over onto the desk, alarming the editor and two producers in the suite. Finally, I confess for the last 20 minutes, I had been experiencing sharp chest pains and they tried to convince me to go to the hospital. Despite my insurances that I was fine, maybe it was the small beads of sweat on my forehead or the agony written across my face. They called an ambulance and I was whisked away. And all the while, I kept insisting that I was fine. I'm fine. The black woman's code for there's really too much on my plate, but I'm going to try to figure it out all by myself. However, in the meantime, feel free to dump some more on my overflowing plate. And if some of the shit you dump on my plate falls on the floor, don't worry. I'll sweep it up because I got this. We have witnessed generations of black grandmothers, mothers, aunties, and sisters loudly declare, I'm fine. While working two or three jobs where they probably are dealing with racism and sexism and often feel unseen and unheard with little to no support in their homes or the workplace. They feel that they are weak for asking for help and try to carry the weight of the world on their shoulders, grinning all the while. They don't complain. They just take a deep breath and put on their superwoman cape as they fly off yelling, I'm fine. So now I'm in the emergency room hooked up to a heart monitor. I was still in my Blackberry responding to responding to um, responding to emails until a stern doctor barked at me to put it down. Didn't he know I was running an empire? I wanted to tell him, but something in his eyes told me this was serious. I'm, am I having a heart attack? I asked. Are you concerned about your health? The, the doctor asked. This had to be a trick question, so I hesitated before slowly nodding yes. He told me, you are lucky, you are lucky that you did not have a heart attack, but you're close. Young lady, your heart rate is dangerously elevated. There is severe stress on your heart. Are you taking care of yourself? This one simple question, are you taking care of yourself? Reduce me to a blubbering mess. Care? Me? I should be taking care of myself? I began crying, the ugly Oprah snot dripping down my face cry. I did not want to admit how tired and run down I was. I did not want to talk about the sleepless nights and, the, and my unhappiness. As my grandmother used to say, my tired was tired. And I was supposed to be at the pinnacle of my success, yet I was miserable. I hated my life. I begged the doctor to admit me to the hospital for a few days. A week would be ideal. If I were in the hospital, I would finally have permission to take a much needed rest without any judgment from my family, colleagues, and friends. No one would think that I was, that I was lazy or a quitter. If they said anything, I could feel outrage. Can you believe it? Yes, I'm on bed rest. Strict orders from the doctor. The doctor looked at me in disbelief. You want me to admit you so you could take a rest? I nodded. Yeah, I hope I, I don't think I can. 
Hold on, can I like that comment? I don't know how to use live, but <laughs> um, I'm reading your comment. Are you taking care of yourself? The world doesn't let black women take care of themselves and being alone and not in community. Yeah. Let's get to the end. There's some good questions in the back. <laughs> um i looked the doctor looked at me in disbelief you want me to admit you so you can take a rest i nodded he obviously didn't understand my life he had no idea of the tremendous pressure i was under to run a successful show um manage a wellness center look after a sick family member and try to be the try to be the fixer for all of my friends lives it was obvious that he couldn't comprehend the reality of a black female superhero the doctor shook his head you need to go home and rest. Tell your family and your friends that you need their help. I shot him a dirty look. The doctor signed my release with, the stri with strict orders to take, uh, take a rest and slow down. I went back to my life, but I didn't slow down. Instead, I added more to my plate. I was determined to be a success, and hard work equals success. I was working on the dream, working on the fairy tale I called my life. The girl from the hood who made it out who now had a life that was beyond anyone's wildest dreams. And now here I was again, seven years later, rock bottom and unable to tell my family I needed help. But this time, instead of continuing the charade, the charade I had my first full emotional breakdown in front of my mother. I fully blame her for it. She burst into my home office and glanced at the clock. She was annoyed that I was... <clears throat> I believe this word is, I've never seen this word before, but we're going to read it anyways. Engrossed in sending, in sending out work email with the baby strapped to my chest. It was at 7.45 p.m. and she wondered why I had not put the baby in the bath or fed him. She firmly reminded me of how important it was to keep him on a schedule. Trey, 7.30 p.m. is his bedtime. You need to do better. I felt the quiet I felt the quiet rage rise in me and I tried to bite my lip but this time I had to say something with my voice barely a whisper I started I I'm sorry y'all I stated I'm not doing well I'm not doing well mom My mother pretended that she didn't hear me didn't make eye contact and headed to the bathroom to busy herself with running the baby's bath I handed the baby to my sister who had entered the room. I then followed my mother, desperately trying to get her to look at me. The tearful words m tumbled out w without any warning. Mom, I'm really not doing well. I don't think I can do this. I sat on the edge of the bathtub as a wave of emotions, over, um, as a wave of emotions overtook me. I needed to, for her to see this pain. I needed to be okay to release it. The tears seemed to explode some from some place buried within me. Giant tears ran down my face and my mother couldn't ignore it any longer. Awkwardly, she came over to me um, to pat me on the shoulder, which is the closest my mother has ever come to physical tenderness with me. And I knew she was trying her best. She didn't look at me, but instead focused on a spot above my eyes. I knew she didn't want to fully witness my tears or the pain in my eyes. This was already too much for her. Trey, you're going to be fine. You must remember whose child you are. Remember your grandmother. Remember me. We had it way worse. We never gave up. You can't let this break you. And yes, my mother's solemn pep talk gave me some comfort. But I also recognized that moment that my mother was not comfortable with my vulnerability or my emotion. My mother knew how to teach me to be strong but she didn't know how to teach me to feel all my feelings and express them, live with them, acknowledge them, and sit with them. My mother could hear... <clears throat> excuse me, y'all. Um, one second. My mother knew how to teach me to be strong, but she didn't know how to teach me to feel all my feelings, express them, live with them, acknowledge them, and sit with them. My mother could be my cheering squad, my person who reminded me to keep my chin up, but she couldn't be my safe, soft spot. She could not be the place where I could fall apart, and right then, I needed to fall apart, but she would not allow it. She believed that it was unsafe for black women to fall apart, that there was no room in our lives for vulnerability or fra fragility. Fragility? I think that's how you say that. Whatever. I, need, I needed to find that safe space for myself in order to survive. A safe space where I could cry with abandonment. My mother looked at me and said, now go get the baby. 
Yes, we are. <laughs> um, now go get the baby. He needs to be bathed. I nodded, swallowing my tears. We bathed my son together in a loaded silence. That night, I started to think about whether I was in this, in this type of safe space for other black women in my life. How many times when friends came to tell me, did I turn into my mother, reminding them of their strength and leaving empower, empowering messages on their voicemail? I sent them Angela Davis quotes, but I never said to any of my friends, hey, sis, you may need to cry about that. I was also guilty of telling my sisters, girl, you've got this. But what if you don't? But what if you don't got it? What if you're so damn hurt and confused that you don't have the mental capacity to get back up? I want it to fall apart. Could my sister friends witness that and be okay with that? And could I be okay with them seeing me fall completely apart? And that's when I and that's what I needed someone to say to me that it was okay to feel wounded. It was okay at this very moment to fall apart, not once, not twice, but as often as needed. How could I grant myself and other women permission to fall apart? And how could I be intentional about creating safe spaces for them and myself? I sat with these thoughts for days and I could not let them go. In my mo <clears throat> excuse me, y'all. In my many moments of pondering, I was reminded of a quote by Audre uh, Lord. We have to consciously study how to be tender with each other until it becomes a habit because what is because what is native has been stolen from us the love of black women for each other. Audre Lord was right. I knew how to be strong, yet I did not I did not know how to be tender. My mother and grandmother had made me the woman that I was and without their valuable advice, I would never have made it this far and had amazing life had this amazing life and career. But in delivering their get up and stop and stop feeling sorry for yourself message uh, <clears throat> they forgot to how to show me um or offer me any tenderness therefore i did not know how to offer that to myself and if there was ever a time that i needed tenderness love and care now was that moment i was tired of being a strong black woman i wanted to study how to be better with myself how to be tender with myself and um that's the end of the first chapter and there's some discussion questions in the back. Um, what does tenderness mean to you? Another question is, how do you show yourself tenderness? How do you show tenderness to others? Number three, was your mother or primary caregiver tender with you? And number four, how can you improve in offering tenderness and compassion to yourself? And feel free to uh, drop um, anything in the comments. Um, for me, for number one, what does tender tenderness mean to you? Um, I think a common theme recently has been showing um, showing myself, showing others grace. Um, I don't think that... <laughs> I don't think that we um, as human beings, especially as um, black women, um, we we don't get grace. So therefore, well, I'm not going to say that we don't get it, but a lot of us don't get grace um, for mistakes. Um, we don't get grace for our emotions. Um, and so therefore, when we become adults, it's hard for us to show ourselves grace and to um, also extend that grace to other people because, um, you know, if you knew better, you do better. So um, I think that right now um, I constantly remind um, other people right now, hey, we are we are like living really differently now um, and you've been living your life a certain way for X amount of time. And right now it's just not working and that's okay. Um, it's okay. Like I'm a grad student. Sometimes I'm, I tell other grad students, I didn't do the readings. Let me tell you why. Cause I was tired. <laughs> I have been trying to keep up. Um, it's okay for you to skip a reading. It's okay for you to email that professor. I don't have the capacity for this. I don't have the spoons for this. It's okay to tell a supervisor, hey, I'm tired, um, or I need some time, or, you know, 
I'm hurting anything, but it's also kind of a challenge in itself to be vulnerable with people, especially people you're not sure who are going to extend that grace. Um, and that's okay too. Um, I'm just going to read these comments. I try not to say things to myself that I wouldn't say to a child or my best friend. That's a great way. That's a great way. Um, being tender for me is allowing myself to fail and those failures don't define me. That part. <laughs> um so i'm gonna go on to the next question uh well actually i think we just answered the first and the second question number three um was your mother or your primary caregiver tender with you for me <laughs> i have a virgo mother uh, and also my mom was a strong independent black woman raised by another strong independent black woman and so on and so on um, I don't ever remember a time where like I could go and hug my well, I could hug my mom, but she'd be like, All right, go on. My mom was also like Trey Anthony's mother. You need to be productive. Um, you need every second of your day, you need to be doing something, you know, accomplishing towards your future. Um, and also one thing that I found very strange when I was young, well, when I was like a teenager, getting my heart broken by boys, my mom would be like, Why are you crying over them? Like, you know, why are you doing that? And so, um, or, you know, even the whole spiel on how I need to be focused on my future. So um, as I'm getting older, my mom, my mom is becoming more tender with me. Um, she, she's working on it and that I'm grateful for um, because I feel like it also heals our relationship. And... Um, and also, as life goes on, I don't, I can't predict the future. But one day, I hope to be married and have children, and I want that to extend to my, to my, my kids and, and generations on. It's okay to be tender with your children. <clears throat> um, how can you improve in offering tenderness and compassion to yourself? I think I kind of sort of answered that though. Um, I try not to hold things um, against myself. Also going back to Ren's comment. Um, and Oprah. Um, going back to those comments. I think that those um, those comments align with that question. Um, you know, not saying things to yourself that you wouldn't say to a child or, or your best friend. Um, and then also... Allowing yourself to fail and not letting those failures define yourself. And the affirmations at the end of this chapter, this is one thing I really liked about the book. They, um, she included affirmations in the back. This one is, I am so glad to be receiving kind and tender love. I work hard, so I rest when my body tells me it is tired. I love and accept myself. And fun fact about this chapter, last night I was trying to finish up the book after doing a bunch of readings and I started reading this chapter and I was like, oh, I'm adding stuff to my plate. Oh, it's overflowing. And I was just like, oh, this is really, you know, aligning with how I'm feeling right now. And after that, I ended up closing the book because I was like, you know what? I think it's bedtime. I need to rest. Um, so we have about 20 minutes. Um, let me see how long the other chapters are. The chapters aren't long at all. Um, they're very interesting. Um, so that way they don't really feel very long. Um, I think I can get into the next chapter. Um, it doesn't seem that long. And the next chapter is called The Strong Black Woman. And the next song on the Black Girl playlist is Ladies First by Queen Latifah. I'm going to have to download that because I haven't already. I haven't listened to that yet. But that's the second chapter. And... It begins, um, my mother and grandmother instilled in me a, many valuable life lessons. I'm a product of their ambition and strong work ethic. I remember as a little girl being in my bed and glancing at the clock to see it was 11 p.m. I could hear the familiar clanking of the ironing board and I knew what my grandmother was doing. I climbed out of bed and I watched through her cracked open bedroom door as she sprayed starch on her, as she sprayed starch on her blue work shirt. To this day, every time I hear the term blue collar worker, I think about my grandmother ironing her shirt each night. And let me go back because I um, don't know if I told y'all the chapter's title and um, it's called The Strong Black Woman. 
My grandmother was tired, but there was a determined look on her face as she pressed her shirt with pride. Getting ready for the night shift. She swept the train at night for London British Transport, and she was proud of her government job. My grandmother, my grandmother taught me, taught me watching, <clears throat> excuse me y'all. My grandmother taught, caught me watching her and gave her, gave me a weary smile before telling me to go to bed. I had school in the morning and I needed to get my sleep because learning requires a rested head. Little girl, go to bed. That brain of yours needs rest. You need to do good in school so you won't have to work at night like your poor granny. I went back to bed, but was unable to sleep because my eight-year-old brain knew this wasn't right. It wasn't fair I got to rest when my grandmother was so tired. It wasn't right that my grandmother had to leave her house in the dark to go to work. Yet, I also vowed to work hard to make my grandmother proud, and so that maybe one day she, would have to, she wouldn't have to work so hard. Later in adulthood, whenever I felt the need to rest or complain, I would always scold myself and say, your grandmother left her house every night to sweep a damn train and you want to complain about your comfortable life? Stop being lazy and get it done. At the height at the height of my television success, I was well aware that in one month I probably made more money than my grandmother made in a year. So I didn't have the right to complain about anything. My grand my mother and my grandmother had it so much so much worse. How so how dare I complain about life being hard? If you gather a group of successful black women, many of us will share tales of what our grandmothers and mothers sacrificed for us to have for the success that we have today. We wear our mother's sacrifices as a badge of honor. This is, is exemplified in a quote to Sydney Labatt, a black medical student who tweeted it along who tweeted it along with the image of 15 black medical students in their white lab coats standing outside of slave quarters. We are truly our ancestors' wildest dreams. It was not uncommon for mothers to do without in order to, in order to pay for our college tuition or work several jobs, to pay for our books, housing, and food. We have seen them get up, worn and tired, to provide for us, and we are reminded every day how much they sacrifice for their children. From them, we learn the unspoken rule. You work hard, you don't complain, because ain't no one got time for that. To mirror the strength and grit of our mothers and grandmothers, many of us continue to ignore our fatigue, burnout, and our body stress signals. We ignore the fact that we are falling apart because the running dialogue in our head is, girl, get up and be strong. You can do it. Yet that night in the bathroom, as my life was falling apart and my mother was giving me her stern pep talk about survival, I knew I needed more. The strong black woman trope was no longer working for me. I wasn't feeling strong. I was scared, overwhelmed, and petrified of my own perceived weakness. I knew I needed to create a safe space to fall apart. Finding your safe space. Trey, find your safe space. I wrote that in my journal, but as my life continued to tell spin, it fell to the bottom of my list. But the universe has a way of reminding you of what you need. It was 1.30 a.m. and I had been a new mother for less than two weeks. My mother and sister returned home, convinced that, I ha convinced that I had it all under control. How could I not? I was a fighter, not a quitter. But that night, the baby cried nonstop. All my efforts to figure out what was wrong weren't working. I paced back and forth, holding the screaming baby in my arms. How could I not calm him down? I felt like a failure. I began crying. This is too much, I thought. So I reached for my phone. I needed help. I, I attempted to call my friend, Tracia. No, it's not too late. Oh, sorry, I read that wrong. No, it's too late. I hung up the phone before it started ringing. The baby was still screaming. 20 minutes later, I knew I couldn't take a minute more. It was after 2 a.m. I quickly dialed Tracia's number again. Thankfully, she answered. I yelled into the phone. I need help. I cannot do this. 15 minutes later, Tracia was at my door. She took one look at me. I was disheveled and, <clears throat> and panicked. She grabbed the crying baby. Girl, go to bed, I protested. She gave me a stern look that said, I got this. I retreated to my bed and I could hear Tracia soothing the crying baby. Guilt rushed over me as my weary head hit the pillow and I slept for seven solid hours. 
I knew Tracia was I knew Tracia was one of my safe places. She assured me that she and her wife would be here for me. And they were. They made a care schedule for me, ensuring that for the next four weeks, I had someone who would be there at night with the baby. She and her wife assured me that I wasn't a lousy mother and that I need and what I needed was support. They showed up time and time again without me asking. And if there's anything I learned in this process of falling apart, it is important. It, it is how important it is to have friends who allow you to come undone and who pick up all your broken pieces and patch you back together. They allowed me to go over all the painful details of my breakup over and over again. They allowed me to cry, and yes, they sometimes offered me encouraging pep talks, but they also stood in the gap bearing witness to my pain. They didn't look away. And the next section is, um, can white women be our safe places? I have two very close white friends. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to go through the comments one more time before I started reading. Hey, Cody. <laughs> I think I can wave. Oh, oh look. <laughs> um, can white women be our safe places? I have two very close white friends. Lisa is Jewish and Jewish and has known me for most of my adult life. She has gone through every single heartbreak with me, and I can honestly say she knows me better than anyone. Carrie is one of my business and writing partners, and over the years has become a dear friend. I have a rule about having white friends. If I cannot talk about race and you can't acknowledge that life is harder for me as a black woman than it is for you, we cannot be friends. If I, can, if I can't call you and tell you to go get your people because they messed up again, we can't be friends. If your response to to hashtag Black Lives Matter is all lives matter, all lives matter, we can't be friends. So my white girlfriends are some of the dopest chicks I know. They are fist. I'm sorry. Oh, y'all. They are fierce feminists <laughs> who are constantly checking their privilege and we have deep and thoughtful discussions about race, sexism and life. So during the period when my life was falling apart, I realized I was de very different when I was very different when my two closest white friends, <clears throat> well, oh, I read that wrong, backtrack. I realized I was very different when around my two closest white friends. With them, I cried my eyes out. Each of them encouraged me to cry while also being very, very affectionate for me. The first time I saw Lisa, I rushed her, I rushed into her arms and she cradled me like a baby and gave me the longest hug. She held me for like, uh, she held me for at least five minutes while whispering into my ear that everything was going to be okay. I realized that I didn't have this level of physical intimacy with any of my black sister friends, and I was very curious. Why didn't I feel safe requesting or desiring physical comfort for them? And why did I feel a need to perform, I got this? Why was I scared to show my black friends that I wasn't as strong as I had led them all to, to believe? There was an unwritten black girl code of sis, get the fuck back up. Ooh, that I had unfortunately prescribed to. So when my black friends reached in to hug me, I was uncomfortable with their tenderness and affection and would brush them off. I wanted to the, I wanted to I wanted I wanted them to know that I wasn't weak. So I constantly assured them that I was doing okay. But they all knew I was lying. When it came to caring, I was comfortable with her affection and I allowed her to comfort me. She's a towering brunette, close to six feet, and I'm barely five feet. Upon seeing me, she scooped me up in her arms while tenderly stroking mine as I practically cried into her belly button. A few days into her visit, she sat me down and firmly said, Trey, I don't think you're crying enough about this. You need to cry and let it out. Stop being strong. And she was right. I needed to stop acting strong. I needed to let all my friends know that I wasn't doing well. I was a big emotional mess, barely holding, barely holding it together. My heart felt as if it had been scattered across the floor of my apartment and I was desperately trying to find all the pieces. I barely recognized the girl looking back at me. My thoughts were a jumbled mess and every day I vowed that today would be the day I would pull myself together. I was so used to being strong that I had actually given myself a deadline for when this grief needed to be over. I had forbidden myself to cry anymore, but I just couldn't stop. And what I soon realized is grief doesn't have a timeline. I didn't need to get back on the horse. I needed to throw myself on the ground and wail. I needed to sit, I needed to sit in this pain and feel every second 
every, feel every single ounce of it to survive and learn the lessons. I was thankful for friends who showed up in, in droves to hold me, listen to me, hold the baby, pack boxes, bring food, and check on me. I was proud that I had cultivated a circle who were determined to show up for me in my time of need because that wasn't always the case. As I've gotten older, I have become more selective with my friendships. I now know that I need friends who will give me pep talks. I need friends who will physically hold me. I need friends who will give me the harsh, plain truth. And I need friends who will just sit with me in the grief. And, oh, here you go. Um, this is what the book looks like. I see that someone had commented. And it's called Black Girl in Love with Herself by Trey Anthony. It's a really good book. <laughs> Um, and so, um, the discussion questions, um, on this page, and this will be the last little bit. Do you have a friend with whom you, with whom you would feel safe having a full meltdown? What does cultivating a safe space mean to you? When comforting a friend, are you physically intimate with them? If not, why? And the last one is have a discuss have a discussion with your sister circle about physical intimacy in your friendship. What could it look like or be? Um, so feel free again for those of you who joined us. Um, feel free if you want to. Um, you know I'll go through the questions again um, while we have time, and uh, drop anything you want in the comments about the questions if you want to answer them or if you just want to say something just drop them down there um again number one do you have a friend with whom you feel safe having a full meltdown um i have one actually i think two my first one is romy my friend romy i love romy romy has seen all of my meltdowns <laughs> and i um am very grateful that i have a friend um who i can be vulnerable with um, my other one is my friend Ashley. Um, I haven't had a meltdown yet. I think she's just seen me on one of my bad days. Um, <laughs> and I like dropped like two tears in front of her, which is a big thing for me because I have a hard time being vulnerable with others. So again, the, the question is, do you have a friend with whom you feel safe having a meltdown? Number two, what does cultivating a safe space mean to you? Um, for me personally, uh, a safe space for me um, is a respect is a respectful place, um, a place space, um, a nurturing space. Um, I am now getting checked on the pep talk while reading this book. I am one of the friends who always gives the pep talks. So you gonna be all right. It's gonna be okay. Um, you know, I do offer my support, but I never really tell my friends to. Um, it's okay to cry, um, only because I I think that's something that is internalized within myself. Um, so that's one thing I think I can do to uh, continue or add to the cultivation of a safe space um is just reassuring my friends that it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to cry it's okay to do whatever you want in the safe space it's meant for you um number three um when comforting a friend are you physically intimate with them if not why number three i don't think that i'm physically intimate with friends like i might reach out for a hug um, depending on the friend, but I'm not a very touchy person. Um, I think that goes back to childhood. I, my cried, my mom was not like, she was like, you need to cut that out. <laughs> um, having a discussion with your sister circle about a uh, physical intimacy in your friendship, what could it look like or be? Um, personally for me, I think that I could, just be like, oh, could I, you know, consent is everything. Ask for a hug. Oh, could I please have a hug? I don't feel good. Or, you know, just communicate those types of things. And the affirmations in the back of this section are, I am beautiful, successful, and confident. I listen to my body and I rest when needed. Tenderness to myself is my birthright and I practice it every day. I am glad that I am loved and supported wherever I go. And that's it for today. So that's the book. Um, actually went on a whim um, and selected this book for the reading. 
Um, but I'm really glad that I did choose this book. Um, there are some other, while I have five minutes, I'm going to run through this. Um, there are some other contents in the book that would relate to um, self-love, healing, um, and I'll just name them off. We read these two, Dear Mama, The Strong Black Woman, and the other ones that we did not get to. <laughs> um, oh, you're totally welcome. Um, I'm really glad that I got to do this because I do not really facilitate things and I'm glad that people are enjoying this because I was very nervous. So that made me feel a whole lot better about this. Oh, I don't know how to use live yet. Anywho, but the other chapters are, um, sis who got, sis who's got your back. Um, I know we're family, but you're a hot mess. That's going to be a good chapter. <laughs> more money, more problems. Sis works hard for the money. Sis, can we talk therapy? Getting rid of the drama in your life. Sis, make that change. Mindset, manifestation, and vision. Um, love, sex, and intimacy. Black women and vulnerability. Keep the faith, girl. Daddy issues. Sis, who hurts you? And the last chapter is beautiful black girl. So... That's the book. And I'm just going to read through the comments real quick. Thank y'all for saying great job. I was so nervous and I was stuttering, but <laughs> look, I'm trying to be my perfect, imperfect self with y'all. So, um, well, let's just say in authentic. There we go. Great job. Oh, yes. Going back to um, friend groups, uh, ask your friend what they need and a list of a few things you can offer them. That would be great um, because I know sometimes I feel like personally I can just give my friends whatever and like not whatever, but like I have the fix for them. And that's not how that works. Um, people need certain things. Oh, hey, Sarah. <laughs> All right, y'all. So I'm going to log off. Everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the weather outside. It looks better. <laughs> so yeah, thank y'all for coming and have a great day, everybody. I don't know how to get out of here. Oh, there, right there. <laughs>